church. Great to be with you this morning as we continue to study God's Word together through the Gospel of Luke. And we've been taking our time chapter by chapter, verse by verse, following along. Um, this morning it's going to bring us to Luke chapter 19. We're going to pick up in verse 28, but by way of recap, if you weren't with us last week, Jesus, as he's approaching Jerusalem, he's beginning to get a sense looking around at the people who are with him that they're thinking he's coming into this city and he's going to overthrow the the Romans that are in charge here and he's going to establish his own physical kingdom on earth. And so he's he's recognizing their, their false expectations of what he's coming to do and so he tells them a parable, a parable about a master who goes away to a faraway country, that he might receive a kingdom for himself. And while he leaves, he entrusts to his servants these minas, an amount of money, probably somewhere around three or four months' wages for one of them. And he entrusts them to do business while he's gone, so that when he returns, there will be an increase upon what he has given them. It was the serious business of stewardship that we were looking at. What are we doing with what God has given us? Because we recognize Jesus has gone to a faraway country. He's with the Father. He's been given His kingdom, and He will return one day in power. But in the meantime, He has entrusted to each one of us gifts, resources, time, energy, families, a reputation, And what are we doing with these things that God has entrusted to us? Are we stewarding those well? Are we busy about the business of His kingdom so that when He returns, He will find faithful stewards, people who have handled well the things He has given us and used them for His glory and the increase of His kingdom? And maybe you're not sure what all you've been gifted with, but we all have been given the gospel of Jesus Christ that He has called us to steward well. And so first and foremost, how are we being the salt and the light in this world that is going out there and and stewarding well that gift we've received in Jesus? But we also saw the unfaithful steward, the one that was fearful, the one that hid it and kept it to himself and did not bring an increase, and even what he had was taken from him and given to others. But may we always be people who say, Lord, with open hands, all that you've given me, I want to give back in service for your glory and the good of your kingdom. Well, it's after he's shared this parable with them that we're going to get to our text this morning. And our text this morning is a significant one. It's only the second time in the timeline of Jesus' life that is mentioned by all four Gospels so far through the book of Luke. The first was the feeding of the 5,000, a significant event that all the Gospels take time to mention. But here we're given the second time in all four Gospels this far into Jesus' life where they say, we need to pause We need to all make detail and note of this because this is a significant moment. It's a moment that marks the beginning of what we call Passion Week, the time from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday, this final week of Jesus' life as He's entering Jerusalem. It's what we commonly refer to as the triumphal entry of Jesus. But let's pick up in our text in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28, and here's what we read. When he had said this, the parable we mentioned from last week, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. 
Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitudes of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And God, as we open your word this morning, Lord, as we look at your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, you boldly entering that city that you knew would would come to your crucifixion, we thank you for the love we see within your pursuit. We thank you for the example you set before us that we should follow. We thank you, Lord, for these living words that remind us that we may never forget. And God, we pray this morning as we sit before your word that you would open our eyes to see beyond mere words to your instructions, your heart for us. Lord, we pray that you would also, by your Holy Spirit, Implant this word in our hearts and give us the strength and ability as we leave this place to walk these things out, Lord. We want this to be more than just an intellectual study, God. These are transforming words, powerful words that endure forever. God, we want to heed your instruction. We want to live in light of this text for your glory. So meet us in this time, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, amen. Well, nothing too creative or fancy today, but if you want to write down a title, you could write this down this morning, The Triumphal Entry. The Triumphal Entry. I know, I came up with that myself. Uh, Now, this morning we're looking at Jesus making his way into Jerusalem. And it's been called The Triumphal Entry, which is a little humorous because If you think about it, so many of the ways he's entering this city seem anything but a triumph. I mean, he's not had some incredible military victory that he's coming in with. He's not coming in with this huge army and this great strategy to overthrow this government. And and when you're looking at it from the outside, now you and I go, oh, I see where the victory is coming. I see the triumph he's about to have. But for them... The way that Jesus was going to bring victory in Jerusalem was going to look nothing like what they expected. In fact, if you would have asked people after his crucifixion, what would you have described his entry into Jerusalem like? That is the biggest letdown ever. Like we thought this guy was coming in and he was going to overthrow these people and we were going to have a new leader and now he's dead. He's on a cross. All our hopes and dreams are gone. It was anything but a triumphant life he had in Jerusalem this last week. And yet, we can see the full picture. We know what comes with that next Sunday. We know the resurrection and the call for those disciples to go out and wait for the Spirit to come upon them. We were part of that church age. We've seen the power and the victory that came as he entered Jerusalem here. But for them, it would have looked very different. Now, as he's coming towards Jerusalem and he's, he's coming up to the Mount of Olives where then he would have to go down into the Kidron Valley as he approaches Jerusalem, he sends a few of his disciples ahead. But he's led the path. He's taken the charge and gone before them all the way as they approach Jerusalem. You see, Jesus knows exactly what awaits him there. He's, he's not unaware of his trial that's going to take place, the betrayal that's going to happen, or his crucifixion. He knows all of it quite well. He's been warning the disciples that this is why he came, and this is what's going to take place. But you know what we don't see? We don't see Jesus behind the disciples approaching Jerusalem hiding. We don't see him fearfully kind of tiptoeing into the city and trying not to make any kind of news or awareness of his presence, we see him boldly lead them in moving forward towards his end. 
Charles Spurgeon has this to say about Jesus leading them in. He says, he went on ahead of them. As the shepherd goes before the sheep, not driving but leading, as the captain goes before his soldiers, as taking the post of danger, so our Lord went on before them. He led them on their way to Jerusalem, and he would lead by example all the way as he went to that cross, and even in his last moments would be continually thinking of them and giving them an example to follow. But as they've approached the city, now he's going to send two with a specific task. Now, we don't fully know which two. The text doesn't give us details as to which two of the disciples it was he sent into town. It's possible that it's Peter and John, and we assume this is possible because in chapter 22, verse 8, they're the two that he will send on a mission together to prepare a place for Passover. So it's possible that this is another mission he sent these two on, but regardless of which two it is, it's an interesting instruction he gives them, isn't it? Like if, if you and I just think about following Jesus and we're excited, we're entering this place and big things are happening, and then he says, hey, you two, I want you to go into the city, I want you to find a colt, it's going to be tied up, and I want you to go and untie it and bring it to me. And if the master says, what are you doing with my colt? You just say, our Lord has need of it. Like, okay, Jesus, I trust you. I, I believe you have a plan here. This, this is not usually how things work. No other explanation. No, you're not sending us with money. You, you, you didn't just go to the first colt we see tied up and bring it to you. But as we followed and seen Jesus calling these disciples, you've seen a number of times that he's given them a task that seemed a little foolish, and yet he had a plan in the midst of it. Think about Peter when he first was called by Jesus, and he'd been fishing all night long, and he'd caught nothing, and this was a fisherman. If somebody knew how to catch fish, it was this guy. And then as he's just done, and he's given up, and it's, we're just not going to catch anything today. The fish aren't biting. He's making his way in, and Jesus says, hey, wait, 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 go back out and just cast your net over the side. Peter's like, oh, brother. Hey, buddy, I don't know if you know much about fishing. I've casted it over both sides. I've casted it everywhere. I'm not catching anything. Just do it. All right. And he casts his net over again, and I'm sure it's a big sigh. <laughs> and then that net just fills up with fish to the point that the, the boat is like breaking, trying to hold all these fish in it. And Jesus says, now I want you to follow me, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Or what about a time when they needed to go pay taxes, and Jesus says, go fishing again. And when you catch a fish, you're, you're going to reach in its mouth, and you're going to pull out the money we need to pay for taxes. And they're like, oh, gosh. We've caught a lot of fish, Jesus, but no fish has ever had money in its mouth ready for us. But sure enough, they do that, and they have the money they need to pay their tax. And I love that men that knew fishing quite well twice have had an experience where they're like, Jesus did something beyond what we understood about fishing, and we thought we'd seen it all. And so I think they've learned enough in their life to go, okay, as ridiculous as this instruction might seem, maybe we should just listen. <laughs> Let's stop arguing. Let's stop questioning Jesus. Let's just step out and see what he wants to do. Maybe he actually has a plan beyond our own. I wonder if I was able to hear from some of you the stories that would be in this room of when you were given an instruction by God that on the outside just made absolutely no sense. And you're going, I don't know, that would make no financial sense. That would seem so foolish. Like, really, Lord, you want me to go do that? You want me to spend money there? You want me to travel there or, or say that to this person? That doesn't make sense. But you trusted him enough to say, but at your word, Lord, okay. And you see God work in incredible ways. You see him show up and you're like, man, I never would have imagined in a million years that would have happened. But if I would have questioned you, if I would have not followed what you told me to do, I would have missed it. And this moment that seems so insignificant, really, you want us to go get you a cult? 
okay, we'll go get the donkey. And these two are walking to town like, man, how do we get the short straw that we got to walk ahead? We're going to be embarrassed. This is going to be awkward. And, and yet this is a moment that is significant because Jesus is going to ride on that colt into this city, fulfilling prophecy of the coming Messiah who would ride in on a colt. See, a moment that seemed insignificant and even awkward for them was a moment that was going to fulfill prophecy and be used by God in ways they didn't even understand. And may that be something we remember when the Lord puts on our heart to do something that we go, oh, that's insignificant. It doesn't really matter. Oh, that's going to be weird. I don't want to make the situation weird. Oh, that I... What if you just stepped down in obedience and said, Lord, I don't pretend to know all that you're going to do with this but I want to be obedient and I want to be faithful and so I'm going to step out and I'm going to do my part. Now, I wish I could say it always works this simply, right? Imagine going to buy a house. I'll take it. Yep, I'll take the house and the Lord has need of it, so give me the title. I would love that car. The Lord has need of your car. Let me, let me have that over. Hand me your keys. But in this moment, as they are untying that colt, the master goes, hey, hey, what are you doing with that? And they're like, oh, here we go. Uh, the Lord has need of it? And he's like, okay. All right. <laughs> Take the colt back to Jesus because the Lord had need of it. Now, as Jesus is going to ride this colt into town, you have to realize something. He's a wanted man. In John chapter 11, Verse 57, it says, The chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command, if anyone knew where he was, they should report it, they might seize him. So this is the word that's going out about Jesus. They're like, you keep an eye out for this guy. He's caused enough trouble. If, if you find him, let us know, and we're going to have the guards seize him. We're going to take over. And Jesus He's going to ride a colt right on into town. The crowd's going to be cheering him on and celebrating. It is this big old show. He doesn't sneak in the city through a back alley in the middle of the night in the bright sunshine with a crowd shouting and welcoming him, knowing what, uh, what awaits him in that city. He still boldly just rides right on in. Now, it's important that we note the detail that he's going to ride in on a colt of a donkey and not on a horse. You see, the horse was an animal of war. You know, when we picture horses, you might think of what the, the Roman soldiers would be riding in on, these massive animals prepared for war that would help them tower above others that they might fight in battle a strong animal, a bold animal that would run full speed right into a battle, would trample over men, and if they were ever in danger, could quickly get them out of it. That's the purpose of a horse for battle, for victory, for strength, to give you an advantage and a quick escape if you needed it. But Jesus isn't riding in to that city on, an, on a war horse ready to make battle with the Romans and stomp anybody that tries to get in his way. What's he riding into town on? A donkey, the colt of a donkey that nobody's ever even ridden on. And there's a number of details about this that are significant. I promise you, I have had to shave down my message because we could spend 45 minutes talking about the cult of a donkey, and I don't think that's what anybody needs this morning. But there's a lot of significance in a donkey. First, it's an animal known for its stubbornness, not its bravery and its obedience. And this is a colt that's never been ridden on. So if you want to talk about them being stubborn, now think about one that's never had anybody sitting on it, and Jesus is going to ride on that. These were animals that were not taken out to war. This was a work animal. This was an animal to carry your burden, your baggage. An animal used in peaceful times, not in war. In fact, it was customary in their time that a king who would, who would enter a city in peace would ride on a donkey. He's not coming for a fight. You know that by the animal he's on. Like, he's not going to do any damage on that thing. So clearly he's coming in peace. 
And who's riding on this donkey but the Prince of Peace? The one who came to, to bear our burden, to carry our load, to take the full weight of sin. Yeah, there you go. There's your donkey, right? And it's stubbornness. I mean, have you ever tried to move one of those animals when they don't want to move? They're not going anywhere. But Jesus comes in riding on a colt. And it's interesting that we're given the details, one on which no one has ever sat. There was only one man who could sit in the seat of authority and bring peace between men and God, and it was the man Jesus Christ. And the strength was not in the animal he rode into that city, nor the army of disciples that came with him. No, he possessed within himself the power, the authority, and the ability for victory. And he was fully sufficient. You know, what's interesting as well is that when Jesus' mother, Mary, was preparing to give birth to the Savior of the world, how did she approach Bethlehem riding on a donkey? And at the beginning of Jesus' life, he's brought in on a donkey ride into the city, and at the end of his life here as he approaches Jerusalem, he's riding in on a donkey. Now, don't miss the connection as well that he's riding on a colt that has never been ridden on, that he would come through a birth of a virgin who had never given birth to a child before. And then that as he dies on a cross and is laid in a tomb, he's laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a tomb no one's been placed in. Jesus was unique in his birth, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, where he would be the first fruits of the resurrection that he would make available to all people. And this is the Messiah entering Jerusalem. But something else significant worth noting is, is a law that was given back in Exodus chapter 13. And it's a bit of a confusing law, but it's a law that has significance in what Jesus is doing here. It was called the law of the firstborn. We'll pull it up on the screen for you. It's in Exodus chapter 13. It says this, And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open womb, that is, the firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn among you your sons you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in the time to come, saying, what is this? That you shall say to him, by the strength of the hand of the Lord, he brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast, Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. And it shall be as a sign on your hand and as the, as the frontlets between your eyes, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So this law, all the way back in Exodus of the firstborn, the, oh, the firstborn donkey, we need to sacrifice a lamb on behalf of this donkey. Otherwise, we need to break its neck. And they say, and when your kids are going, Dad, what's going on? Why, why are we killing lambs? Why are we breaking a donkey's neck? What, what exactly is going on here? They would share with them the significance of what God did long ago in Egypt when he brought his people out of bondage. And when Pharaoh tried to stop them and he hardened his heart, the Lord brought these plagues, the final one being the death of all the firstborn sons within those homes. And he said, this is going to always serve as a reminder to you so that decades, centuries later when your kids are going, what is this? You can tell them the significance of what God did when he showed himself strong on behalf of our people and brought us out of bondage into freedom. Because in both cases, a lamb had to be slain. And if the owner was not prepared to pay 
the sacrifice of a lamb to redeem the donkey, then that donkey's neck would be broken. And when we carry the truth over from that story, we begin to see the object lesson it is for ages to come. It symbolizes man in all his need of one who can come and redeem us and bring our wayward spirit into a harness, bring freedom from bondage, a people who deserve the wrath and justice of God, who need to be redeemed. And who is this one who's coming in on a cult? It is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is the one who is coming to redeem his people who are in bondage to sin, who cannot get out of it on their own. And he was not forced. Jesus came willingly, and he presented himself on our behalf to break from a bondage of sin as a sacrificial lamb whose blood would be sufficient for the sins of the world, that all who would call on him could be saved. So Jesus sent them. The Lord has need of them. Why does the Lord need this colt so badly? Is he tired? Do his legs need a rest? No. Not the weariness of Jesus, the fulfillment of of prophecy. You see, Zechariah 9 9 says this of the coming Messiah Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. They knew their Messiah was coming. He was coming to bring victory and coming in power, but he was coming in humility, and he was going to be coming riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this is how Jesus, as they bring back this donkey to him, as they lay their clothes over it, and he sits on it, begins to approach and enter Jerusalem. And they're taking palm branches, and they're putting them on the ground. They're taking clothing, and they're throwing it on the ground to pay homage to this king. Just like you've seen in old classic movies when when the woman's going to walk over a puddle or some mud, what does the man do? He takes off his coat, he throws it on the ground so that she doesn't have to step through the dirt. You know, when I was in Africa one time in Kenya, I was told that that they had these famous prophets or so-called prophets that would be coming to town on their fancy jets and the people so wanted to pay homage to these prophets that they would actually, weeks in advance, be preparing a path where they would have people out on the roads who are actually scrubbing the ground with cleaner all the way from that airplane where it would land all the way to where that person would step into a home, and they would clean the entire path of the ground. It's, I mean, it's, it's a pointless effort because the moment they've cleaned it, you know, a dog, a donkey, a, a cow, a car, something's gone over it. But to them, it was this idea of we're paying homage to this special person. We're preparing their way and clearing their path. And although we could have a lot of issues with why they're doing this for these people and why these people are accepting this kind of behavior, but here we see in similar fashion that they're preparing the way for their king to enter Jerusalem. And they're laying down their clothes, and then they begin to shout out and celebrate what he is coming to do. And this idea of a victorious, conquering king entering a city was well known in their time. See, typically in that culture, when a victorious king was coming back into the city, he was escorted by his citizens of his kingdom, by his army with him. And as he entered the city, they'd be singing songs and celebrating his victory like in the Old Testament, right? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. They, they celebrate this military victory. They welcome them into the city. And then as was their custom, the conquering king would then come in, enter into the, the temple and offer sacrifices to honor the gods that they associated with bringing them victory. Well, we'll see that in the coming weeks. Jesus entering Jerusalem and making his way to that temple, but he's got a very different method 
of what he's going to be doing as he cleanses that temple, as he's turning over tables because they're turning the house of the Lord into a, a place for profit, a den of thieves. But the Gospels take this well-formed idea and understanding within their culture, and they begin to flip it on its head. As Jesus doesn't enter in this strength and victory, but in this humility, not with a big army, but with some disciples and on this donkey. And they're, they're celebrating him, they're singing to him, and they're, they're quoting from a psalm a psalm that speaks of the Messiah and his victory. But what they're expecting is that he's going to come and bring this military victory. He's going to come. He's going to overthrow these people. We're going to have a new leader. And this is him. So we want to be on his good side. We want to celebrate what he's doing. Finally, we're going to be free of these Romans and this tyranny. And they're they're shouting out and singing what Psalm 118 says. Verse 26 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. But here's what you need to realize, that that some of these same people here that are laying down palm branches, that are throwing down their clothes, that are celebrating, this is our king. He's coming to bring victory. These are going to be the same people in less than a week that will be in the crowd shouting out, Crucify him! Give us Barabbas. Give us the thief. Give us the traitor. Anybody but this guy. No, crucify him. Kill him. You may be wondering what on earth happens in less than a week to take you from praising someone as king to to shouting out for a man to be crucified and given a, a terrible, torturous death. Well, these are people who were celebrating a king that they thought was coming to bring about what they saw as their good. This this was a, a God in their own image. And they had ideas of what he was coming to do. And when he didn't do what they wanted him to do, when he didn't come in the power they thought he would came in, come in, when he didn't d- establish his authority and his ruling like they thought he would, how quickly they turn on him how quickly the crowds begin to shift and say, all right, well, if he's not overthrowing the Romans, if he's not coming to do what we wanted him to do, then kill him. Get him out of here. We want another one. And we can quickly point the finger at this crowd, but how often are you and I doing the exact same thing? That we come in on a Sunday morning and we we lift our hands and we praise and we celebrate God who's in control that he's worthy of our praise, that his plans are good. And then we can walk out the doors and when something happens in our life that doesn't go according to our plans, that doesn't pan out the way we expected it to, how quickly, maybe we're not using the words crucify him. It's a bit extreme. We're, We're beginning to bring up these questions. God, do you really care? Are you really in control? Are you even listening? Do you see what's going on? Because I thought you were going to do this for me. I thought you were going to bring victory in this way. I thought you were going to show up in that situation. You were going to take away that, and you didn't. And in that moment, are we questioning his authority, or are we laying down our own will and saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done? Because what we need to understand is although he didn't come the way they expected and though he didn't do what they thought he was going to do, he was doing something so much greater. He was doing more than just establishing a temporary kingdom where they could have momentary peace. He was coming to bring victory over sin. He was coming so that he could establish his eternal kingdom, so he could bring eternal peace between God and man. It was something so much bigger than what they had in their minds. But they didn't see it. And so it caused them to question. It caused them to doubt. It caused them to ridicule him and shout out for his crucifixion. 
And when you and I, puffed in our pride, think we know better than God, think we have a better plan than God, and begin to question His ways because they're not our ways, we're following into this same crowd. But may we learn from this example this morning. And may we walk in a humility that understands, though I want it this way, though from what I see, this seems like the best path forward, Lord, I'm holding it with open hands because I trust you see so much more than I do. Your plans are so much greater than my own. And so if you do it another way, Lord, so be it. I trust that you're in control. How fickle the crowds, though. One moment, your greatest cheerleader, moment, crying out for your crucifixion. What I love is that we don't see Jesus so puffed up by the crowd here and then so deflated later when they're crying out for his crucifixion. You see, Jesus knew first and foremost what the Father desired for him to do and what the Father thought of him. And he wasn't motivated and moved by the the praises or the rebukes of the crowd. And it's worth us learning through his example to not allow the words of men to make you or it'll be the words of men that break you. When you live for the praise of men, it'll be great when you have it, but in a moment it'll be gone. And how quickly the crowds can turn and change their opinion. Now let's be people who knew, know who we are first and foremost in Christ. What he says about us That doesn't mean we never give any weight to the words of those close to us, but first and foremost, we are built on a foundation that says, I know who I am in Christ. And so any words that you might have for me are always going to be filtered through what He has said about me, what His Word says about me. And at the end of the day, I care more about what the Lord thinks of me what he says about me, how I'm going to stand before him one day than what the crowds think about me, what other people are saying about you. There will always be people that have something negative to say about you. And there will always be people ready to just sing your praises. Don't allow them to puff you up. Don't allow others to deflate you. You need to spend time with the Father and be reminded who you are in Christ. Because Jesus knew entering that city what the Father had said to him on his baptism, that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so though the people were praising him in this moment and then ridiculing him the next, though some of them would be slandering him and mocking him even from the cross, that didn't make him or break him. He was the Son of God. He was the Messiah, whether people acknowledged it or not. But as the crowds begin to praise him, as people are shouting out and celebrating this coming king, entering Jerusalem, fulfilling prophecy, the Pharisees have a bit of a problem with it. They're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, Jesus, rebuke them. Tell them to stop. They're giving you credit as the Messiah. They're calling you the king. You need to tell them to be quiet. No doubt, partially, this is out of jealousy as the crowds are turning their attention from the Pharisees and on to this rabbi entering the city. It's possible that part of this is is with good intention, and they're going, well, wait, wait, those are words for the Messiah. Those are heavy words. Do you hear what they're saying? But nonetheless, these are misguided words because this was a day Jesus was going to be praised. You know, for most of Jesus' ministry up to this point, what has he continued to do but quiet the people and tell them not to speak of the things he's done? But now as he enters Jerusalem, here we see Jesus invite public praise and adoration of him as the Messiah. There's a pattern that will move forward from this point where Jesus is going to be establishing his authority And also calling into question these religious leaders and this system in Jerusalem that is far from him. As we'll see him do in the temple very soon. But this is his response 
As the Pharisees come up to him, like, whoa, 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 tell them to stop, rebuke them. He's going to actually rebuke the Pharisees. And it's, we see this a number of times when people come to Jesus with a rebuke. Typically, they're the ones that need the rebuke. But Jesus looks at them and he says, hey, if these keep silent, even the rocks would cry out. No, this is a day the Messiah is fulfilling prophecy and entering Jerusalem. This is a significant day that people have waited for for centuries, and this is not a day to be quiet. This is a day that people need to praise the Messiah. And if these people were quiet, let me tell you, all of creation that is groaning is going to lift up its voice and praise God. We almost had our first ever rock concert in Scripture right here. The rocks are going to cry out. I'm sorry, it's bad, I know. But this was a significant day, one that people shouldn't be quiet about, one that was about to bring about the greatest work that had ever happened in all of human history that made salvation possible for us. But you know, in one sense, the rocks were going to be crying out as Jesus entered Jerusalem, because not far from there, not long after that, as Jesus would die on the cross, the earth would shake at His death, and the veil would be torn in the temple and split in two. And then as He would enter a tomb, that rock would be shaken and moved from that place as He would leave that tomb in resurrection life. No, the rocks were going to cry out, not only at His death, but at His resurrection. The stone that was rolled away was crying out and declaring that He is not dead, but He is alive and offers resurrection life to those who place their faith in Him. But this is the significant moment that needed to be declared. And this morning, you may have noticed what a couple kids were telling me earlier was the big bathtub in the front. It's a significant moment this morning for some people in our church because we're going to be having a baptism this morning. I'm going to invite the worship team to make their way back up, and we're going to wrap up our service of the study of God's Word at this time, but we're going to be moving into a time where we actually are going to have a baptism this morning. Now, a couple things we just want to clarify here and now. First and foremost, what is baptism? What's the water doing here? What's the significance of this? So, this is something we're told to do in Scripture. Baptism, to put it simply, it's an, it's an outward expression of something that has happened internally for someone. I was, I was able to be a part of officiating a wedding yesterday for Isaac and Delaney Humber. And, and one of the things you do in a ceremony at a wedding is there's an exchanging of rings, right? And these rings are meant to be a tangible reminder of the vows that they have made, of the commitment that they're entering into. It's, it's a visual thing. That's reminding you of, of a non-visual thing, of this commitment and this, these vows you've made. But in a lot of ways, this is like the wedding ring of your relationship with God. It's, it's this visual thing that demonstrates something that's happened in your life, something that's happened in your heart, that you have died to yourself and you are now living for Christ, that you're a new person in Christ Jesus where old things have passed away and all things are new. This is not holy water. This is water heater water from the gym, okay? But this is the method that God has told us to use to express that before the people of God publicly, that we have died to ourselves, so we're lowered into the water representing dying to the old man. And we are raised up out of the water to represent this new life in Jesus that we are living. And he chose to use water that for them was significant because water was life. I mean, most of them lived in the desert and you couldn't go far without water. You needed it to sustain your physical body. Well, Jesus is the living 
water, and without Him there is no life. He said He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through Him. So as we lower people in the water, we're remembering Jesus, the living water that gives life. Jesus, the one who died first and was resurrected and offers us resurrection life. But also, water represented purification. And when they were unclean, they had to go through a ritual where they were to cleanse themselves in the waters. And we were reminded as we lower people in baptism that they are made pure in Jesus Christ because His blood washes, cleanses them of all their unrighteousness and sin so that we are made right with God so that He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west and we no longer carry the penalty for our sins. Jesus took it on the cross. But also we're told in John 7, 38 that those who believe in Jesus that out of their hearts will flow rivers of living water. See, we abide in Jesus. We, we, we lay down our lives and we trust fully in Him. And He puts His Spirit in us. He gives us a new heart and then out of our lives flow rivers of living water. A new life that He now lives through us. Old ways are gone. All things are new. And we're following in his footsteps as we deny ourselves, we take our cross, and we follow him. And part of the way that's all demonstrated, that incredible work he's done in our lives and the commitment we've made to follow him is demonstrated through one moment where a person gets into the water and is lowered down in baptism and raised back up. But here's what I want to do this morning. Before we move to baptism, I want to give you an opportunity to respond because I don't know all of you in this room. I don't know your story. And maybe you're going, hey, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to get in the water. Well, well step one is to, to place your faith in Jesus. And so this morning, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe you just wandered in here. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you were forced to come. Whatever the reasons may be, this morning if Jesus is, is calling you and he's, he's knocking at the door of your heart and you're recognizing, wow, I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God who, who came to this world and lived a perfect life. And he, he entered Jerusalem and he did die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And I want to be saved. I want to surrender my life to Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that my eternity is sealed and fixed and that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I don't want to face the penalty for my sins. I don't want to spend eternity in hell separated from Him. He's given you an opportunity this morning, here and now, to make that decision. And all that He's called you to do is to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you will be saved. What are you confessing with your mouth? Romans tells us we've all sinned. There's not a sinless person in this room. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the penalty for your sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you would confess with your mouth, first and foremost, that you're a sinner, that you have failed, that you deserve to pay that penalty, and yet, by grace through faith, you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he did die on a cross, and that his payment was sufficient and demonstrated through his resurrection life, he could give me new life. If you confess that with your mouth and you believe that in your heart, not just words you say to appease somebody here, but you truly feel that conviction in your heart and you believe these things. If you confess that in a moment, he'll wipe your slate clean. And maybe you walked in here under the bondage of your sin, your addiction, your struggle, but you could leave this place in freedom, forgiven, a stranger who came in, but a, a part of the family of God walking out those doors, all because of what Jesus did for you. And all you need to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And here's how we would ask you to respond this morning. If you need to make that decision today, 
to either raise your hand or stand up where you are so that we can pray for you this morning. And we ask you to do that publicly because your relationship with Jesus is going to have parts of it that are private in prayer and in studying the word. But he's calling you to be public. He's calling you to be salt and light in this world. He's calling you to profess him before men as he professes you before the Father. And this is step one, is you boldly stepping up and saying, all right, I, I'm going to profess before everybody here, I need to give my life to Jesus. And you will be welcomed. You will be celebrated, not only here, but in heaven. But it starts with you being willing to publicly make that decision. So if you need to make that decision today, this is your opportunity to either raise your hand or stand up where you are so that we can celebrate with you and pray for you this morning. Is there anybody that needs to make that decision? Praise God. I see one here in the back. I see another one right here. Praise God. Anyone else this morning? Now is your opportunity. You two, please stay standing for a moment. All right, here's what we want to do. Can you go ahead? We'll start down here and then we'll move up here. Can you tell me your name? Because we want to be able to pray for you by name this morning. What's that? Kemper? Kemper. Okay, we've got Kemper here down below. And what's your name in the back? Yeah. Danielle? Danielle. So Kemper and Danielle. Would you join me this morning in, in praying for Kemper and Danielle and then celebrating the decision they've made today? to give their lives to Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who saves. And Jesus, what you rode in on that donkey to do in fulfilling prophecy and dying for the sins of the world, you had Kemper and Danielle in mind. Lord, even if they were the only two that would ever follow you, you would have gone to that cross for them. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them this morning, for bringing them to this decision. And Lord, we celebrate their boldness and standing up and acknowledging that they need to make that decision. And so, Lord, we know it's not any special words they need to say, but I pray first in the boldness that they've made in standing up, and also now as we're praying, that they would just acknowledge you as Lord, that they would acknowledge their own sinfulness and their need for you. And God, that that you would take that heart of stone and you would give them a heart of flesh, that you would put your Holy Spirit inside of them, that you would transform them through the renewing of their minds, God, and that they would feel the weight lifted of the burden of their sins. Because your yoke is easy, your burden is light. I pray they would experience that, the, the newness of life, that it would be the joy of the Lord that is their strength, And I pray, Lord, as the body of Christ, that we would come alongside them and welcome our brother Kemper and our sister Danielle into the family of God this morning. Lord, thank you for the work that only you can do. Thank you that you are mighty to save, that where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. And we give you all the honor and all the praise this morning. And it's in your matchless name, Jesus, that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen.